I quote, with this story, Sarah Hall becomes the first author to be shortlisted for the BBC NSSA four times. Say that three times fast. <laughs> <laughs> and she is the only person to ever win it twice, right? I think so. I think so. This was recommended to us by Katja. This is our Patreon pick of the month, so thank you very much. We appreciate all your support. The Grotesque by Sarah Hall, winner of the uh, BBC Award in 2020. And ooh, this one is grotesque say it <laughs> it's a lot of things right like she she appears to me to be a very layered writer right because because there's no clear way i feel like that you you have to interpret a lot of these events like right? even from the beginning the we have our narrator is walking down the street right in the beginning she's you know going shopping for her mummy you know which it, here in America, we don't say that like that's that sounds juvenile. And I don't know if it was meant to or not. But to me, the whole time I thought she was like younger, like maybe teenager. She's running errands for her mom. Yep. I had no idea she was 30 until later in the party. But she, she's walking down. Right. I, I don't know. OK, so it wasn't just me then. No, no, I totally thought she was like 12, 14 years old. I thought okay. she was younger. I had no idea that she was a grown woman. <laughs> right, right, right. So she's she's walking down the streets of London, and that's where we see Charlie Bow, local local uh, homeless man. Is that what we call him? And he's dressed up in fruit. Like clearly, you know, it's like someone's passed out. Like you never want to be the first one to pass out at a sleepover party. Like Charlie Bow passed out first at the sleepover party, and people are you know putting lemons with little pupils on them uh, for his eyes, and a banana for his his mouth for a smile, like. It's I think it I think it's comic, but I think it's also like you're doing it to a human. Right. So so it's offensive. Right. I shouldn't laugh, but I am type of situation. Yeah. And, and Dilly is she she wants to laugh and fit in, but like she feels sorry for for Charlie Bow as well. I think at the same time. And that's where I thought that, you know, she was a young kid because she doesn't do anything about it. Like if I'm a 30 year old person and I see this happening, I'm going to go do something about it. Like I'm going to stop it. And she doesn't. And I guess that says something about her and her family. And we can get into it because whew, what can you not glean from this story? They're just, this, this has so many layers. Well, and, and I think Sarah Hall does a really good job. Like she, she has a quote where she says it was all horribly artistic. Right. And it's the, the horribly aut uh, artistic that makes it kind of like this juxtaposition that allows a reader. It, it invites a reader to to experience the scene. It invites the reader to judge the scene. And it invites the reader, I think, to reflect upon what this scene means to, to us, to people. That uh, It's very rare that you have, I think, a short story that can really, to me, invite a reader in on so many different levels. Yeah, and I guess the level I came into it is I, I think, okay, here's a homeless man uh, kind of portrayed to maybe have some type of mental illness or disability, and people are pranking him, and I'm not sure exactly where, like, the fruit was. I guess maybe, is this set, like, in older times where, like, they still threw fruit at you if you're, you know, doing bad job or something? I don't know why why fruit was the thing, uh, but it just it was so disrespectful, and it just, like, broke my heart of, like, these people call themselves humans and they're treating fellow people like this, especially somebody that doesn't seem to have the ability to kind of stand up for himself. And then Dilly does nothing about it. Right. I mean, they do this to a scarecrow, to a cutout. Okay. Like maybe it's artistic. Maybe it's cool. You do it to a human being that is on the down and outs. Sounds like he can't communicate or defend himself even in a sense doesn't have a home, maybe doesn't have a family. We, we, we don't know, but he, he's missing something. It seems like, and to abuse him this way, that, that that's, that's when we cross the line when we're doing it to a human being. Right. Yeah, exactly. But what was up with, I, I mean, I asked you this question, like why the food? Cause the food seems to be like a constant throughout the entirety <laughs> of the story of the, the bananas and the lemons, the scones. It just, mm -hmm, it, it, mm -hmm. Sarah kept throwing in food after food after food. And, I didn't know what that imagery represented. Well, I don't, I don't know if it has to be one dimensional, right? But I think there's a lot of ways to look at that. Cause you yourself have brought up when we did the dead by James Joyce, uh, that, that has a lot of 
food references and the taste and the smell and it invites the reader in. But also you pointed out that sometimes food is representative of class even. You know, you have more fancy foods, you have more access to foods when you have higher class. Uh, remember, those that can throw away food are those that can afford the food in the first place, right? So even on her walk home, as she's still heading towards her mummy's house, she passes that uh, pastry shop, I think it was, the, the shop that where all the food was really well decorated. And, and to me, again, it's like that class thing, like who could afford this level of class? Who could afford throwing away these things and mistreating others with something that would be precious to them even? So here's another layer that we add on to this is the class division. Yeah, I love it. Brilliant. So brilliant. Charlie Bow wakes up and kind of like, like, like runs after Dilly Dilly's like, oh, I gotta go. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it was very but funny. I thought, I mean, I, I shouldn't laugh because like we shouldn't be laughing, but I did. Well, I mean, she feels even conflicted too. Like she wanted to help, but she's also scared. And I think we've all, we like, you know, you've been in that situation where like you want to help someone and you're like, oh, you really shouldn't get involved. Like, like I get, I think we all get that feeling of when there's what we think we should do, whether it's ourselves or society. And when then there's what we actually, yeah. And then there's what we actually yeah. do. And, and Dilly seems to be caught in that frequently. You know, first we get presented with Charlie Bo with these classmates where what she thinks is right and wrong. And she still doesn't, I think directly intercede. And I think, I don't know, Charlie, I don't know how he feels. We don't know, but I, I think that that goes towards the ending. Let's, let's not get there yet, but she goes, <laughs> she goes home. Right. And I think that same problem of how she ought to act and how she wants to act are at ends with each other because she gets home and ain't nobody making their own mind up unless it goes through mama. Mama, mama. is Mummy. the matriarch of this family, right? Yeah, and I love this layer added on here again in this story is that hierarchy inside of family dynamics of, you know, what your position is, what you're allowed to say, what you're allowed to do, how important you are. And I mean, that really, it, 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 I think it's important to a child, you know, and again, I, I had to rethink the story after I read it and realized that Dilly is not a child that, I mean, she's mummy's child, but she is not the age of a child. And that really uh, kind of made my perception of the story very different after reflecting back upon it. But yeah, that layer of hierarchy in a family is just really cool. Yeah. Well, I mean, she didn't even choose, there was like the paragraph, I can't remember exactly what it said, where it explained a lot of things that she didn't choose her mom chose, right? Such as like, uh, I think she was seeing like Merrick, the, was it the psychoanalyst? Like, mom chose her to go to this psychoanalyst and such like it was like her direction in life was being chosen by her and there's even that quote mummy could change a story or revise history with astonishing audacity and Oof. seem to instantly believe the new version so it's kind of like this mother's presence in her life is so powerful she can change what she thinks are like the way the things that they should be or are and then that's the new reality right it's almost like I don't want to say gaslighting, but it's like the mom can make reality what she wants it to be and make you agree that, yeah, oh, OK, yes, this is what reality is in a sense. Yeah, because you're afraid of her. I think that she's kind of ruling through fear, uh, intimidation, because if you don't agree with mommy, then she she's going to, you know, take it out on you or you're not going to get your party. You're not going to get your gift. You're not going to get your allowance. Uh, maybe you fear of getting kicked out of the house. You know, you, all these terrible things can happen to you. I, I think she kind of lords her position over uh, Dilly for sure. The whole family. Well, she's, she's described as having a concentrated aviary glare. And anytime you're described Ooh. like a bird's glare, that ain't a good thing. <laughs> yeah, never a good thing, right? <laughs> you might as well just call her a crow. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, so crow. We, meet, we, meet the, we meet the family, and how do we describe this family, right? Like they, would you say self-interested, or, or how do you, I mean, each, each, each person's a different character, so it's kind of hard to say one thing to be representative of them all. But they're all very self-absorbed, I feel like, in in themselves or their, their interests? Like, uh, how, how would you describe them? Grotesque. 
No. I think that, it, it, <laughs> I mean, in the beginning of the story, I, I think you're supposed to think maybe Charlie Bow is the grotesque one. And then you realize as the, the story unfolds uh, that Dilly and her family are the grotesque ones, that they're, they're not good people. And they put on these masks for everybody out in society that they're, you know, upper class, good people or whatever. But when you close those doors and you get them in their home, their true colors come out and they are just, they're, mm-hmm. they're not good people. That's how I describe them. Yeah. Self-absorbed just, is, is a good way. Yeah. I, I really like the way they like, like Cleo, like the way you described her as like this self-absorbed trauma ish person is they talked about the perfume, not even being described by the sense, but by like power, like advantage and ascent. And like, <laughs> like I was like, Oh, that's actually a really interesting point to, of how perfume positions itself from a marketing standpoint. Right. It doesn't just be like, yeah, this is strawberry. Right. Like, this is majestic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I guess like they're they're self centered. You know, they they always want for what themselves, even if it's at the the sacrifice of a sibling, and that's just really sad. There, there's no love. I guess that is. Maybe they lack love or empathy. It, we skirt around so many different things that have happened in this family. Um, there, there's clearly a rift, right? And I think Dilly's just kind of like this person who's just. It's like washing over her while as this family moves and bustles about and there's these social things that they're all kind of adhering to. You know, on the way back home, there's these allusions and references to Rebecca and Peter. Oh, well, they wouldn't be at the same party. There's just no way. Right. And yeah. we get there and they're talking about, oh, there's the big family reunion. Like it's 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 finally that we're all back together. D- did you have any inclinations as to what was happening between Peter and Rebecca? No. No, no, I, I would. And, and at the end there, when they're like, yeah, Rebecca was a scapegoat. I was like, huh? OK, didn't see that coming. Yeah, there's a couple of lines just scattered throughout on the way when Dilly was walking back home. She says Rebecca had cried a lot last summer because of the baby. And I'm thinking Rebecca was with Peter, right? And then later it says congenital abusive, your son's twisted priorities and your bloody eugenics. Now it's fine to destroy life. So I, I think Peter and Rebecca had relations and one of them decided to not move forward with this. And I think this is what causes the rift, right? This is, this is, this is deal breaker for some people. And I think sure. the mother ag- agreed with Peter and the mother is the one that kind of pulled them apart. And that's why we have this huge divide in the family now. Ah, so maybe the mommy made the the mommy made the decision, and and uh, so now it, people are resenting her. You know, ooh, that's well. They, that's they pretty say dark. the greatest betrayal is to disaffiliate, right? Oh yeah, I mean she's ostracizing Rebecca for sure, right? Yeah. All right, so okay, community church church is supposed to be a community, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, the father. Ugh. The father this guy seems was... like such a sleaze ball. Was it sleazeball? He was just like, I, I, was it communication? Was it unawareness with the community? Like he didn't even really know who she was. Like <laughs> thought she was Cleo at first. And that's when we find out that she's 30. I was like, whoa, like taken aback at that point in time. Cause I had to like reimagine, like you said earlier, everything that had happened up to that point. But it's kind of like, um, all of this is just like, weren't we supposed to be talking to the magazine lady? Like, like when, Dilly should eat the scone when she should not eat the scone when she should dress up when she should not dress up when she should shower like all of it's so procedural and and isn't this supposed to be her birthday party and the father doesn't even know who she is like like it's a very interesting web because church is as we said is supposed to be community and he doesn't even know who she is I guess in a sense which I was like well how am I supposed to take that <laughs> Well, I think that was kind of a little bit of a dig maybe on the religion itself of that a lot of people think of of religion as, you know, you go on Sunday and it's just that it's like this one day and it's very informal. And a lot of times, you know, in Catholicism, it is all about those rituals. It's, you know, stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down, sing now, do, you know, communion, etc. Uh, sing these songs, sing these songs, you know, got to have Christmas, got to have Easter. And I think that that, you know, creates uh, th- th- this regiment that they have to have. And the father's going along with that. Uh, and I-, I feel like that 
he does he doesn't know this family. I think he's kind of using them. Maybe they are well off and you know, he's looking for them to be a benefactor of the church, you know, make sure they tithe their 10 plus percent. And uh he, he doesn't seem to really care about them, which is, you know, very odd for a father who's supposed to be in a position of, you know, caring and taking care of their immortal souls. Yeah, I, I didn't like yeah. this character. I, I don't know. I feel like maybe Sarah gave a little, you know, stab back to some priest that she didn't like from Catholic school. <laughs> Okay. Well, I, I I don't know where he fits in other than he wasn't connected with the family, right? To me, though, it's it's where does everybody put their energy? And even like what how the mother kind of just bosses everyone around. There's a particular quote in here that I thought was particularly powerful. It says, she had tried to be unmoored, tried to live without protections, but the world was full of grotesque frightening and ridiculous things it was full of meaningless sorrow and contradiction like a sick little baby with a perfect soul and i didn't know if this baby reference was to rebecca and peter and i didn't know you know when we say the story is called grotesque it's talking about these people who are you know complicated thinking about themselves and to to really open yourself up and to embrace being vulnerable in front of others is a is a dangerous thing it's it's hard when the world has all of these things that will hurt you and you know you turn your back for a second like charlie bow all of a sudden you're dressed up with fruit and made made the clown made ridiculed no no one turns to show you compassion even dilly who wanted to show compassion didn't take the step at that time and and charlie bow didn't know that right like he, he just he felt unconnected and the same way that Dilly is so disconnected with several, everyone, even in her family. I think this baby is the loss of innocence. I think it represents the loss of Dilly's ability to empathize with other people. Okay. Okay. Now, going back to what we were talking about earlier, uh, was it Lily? Lily arrives and the mother's like, okay, we have an announcement. And it kind of comes out about the uh, that the man drowned himself in the river, which I believe is meant to imply Charlie Bow. I think there's some references to yeah. the fruits and vegetables. So, um, Charlie Bow, did he drown himself? Was it accidental? Was it suicide? Well, how did you interpret the, the announcement? I feel like because they're so callous about it that it, it he might have taken his own life. They're just like, yeah, you know, that guy that we pulled the prank on, uh, he's not alive anymore. So let's go ahead and have our party. Like there, there's no more to it because uh, they're so callous about it is kind of how I interpreted it. How much does this story remind you of the garden party by uh, Catherine Mansfield? Like remember the neighbor... Oh when they're having yeah. the party and they're still trying to have the party, even though there's this <laughs> deathly news, like, cause, cause and again, the mother was very matriarchal there in terms of bossing people around. Like it's got a lot of uh, similar notes that if you enjoyed this story, maybe you'd like the Catherine Mansfield, the garden party story. No, for sure. Well, Sarah Hall, the grotesque, great story. Highly recommended. Hope you enjoyed today's conversation. What are some things that you noticed and loved about the story? Feel free to share your thoughts in the comments down below we're open to discussion we're not saying that this is everything about the story so we appreciate you spending some time listening to us discuss some of uh, the things that we've noticed in it my name is Benuna. peace out peace